from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It takes a special vision to imagine a biography as literary. You know, the story arc is not yours to chart. A life was lived and an author, an author as skilled as Stacy Schiff has to respect the facts of that life. But within those confines, Schiff is among a very few writers who can infuse true long ago stories with the benefits of storytelling. Gorgeous, gorgeous sentences are essential, but also an, an, an ability to infuse emotion and enliven events that she did not see, but surely someone else did. Prize awarding panels anticipate each of her, each of her next books like a time travel experience that readers could not have known were available to them. Through her extraordinary efforts, readers get an intimate portrait, for instance, of the half-century Nabokov marriage, in which husband and wife were equally committed, not just to a literary livelihood, but to a transportation out of quotidian household woes and toward a lofty, idealistic, dual commitment to art. Similarly, she has sent readers aloft into the mysteries of the aviator and Little Prince author Antoine Saint-Exupéry, and then later, endeavoring to revisit the Boulevardier years of, of a founding father in Paris. I keep thinking of her recent book as Benji Franklin, The Sexy Years. <laughs> That's preparation, of course, for her next, which is Cleopatra. <laughs> On behalf of the festival organizers and the many uh, indefatigable volunteers today, and of course my hardworking colleagues at the Washington Post, I'm honored to welcome and to hear from Stacy Schiff. Thank you. Thanks for turning out. I suspect you're all melting out there because I'm melting up here. Um, if you inferred from Ned's remarks that I have no life of my own, you are correct. Um, but I have been through this biography business a few times, and I have the following observation to offer. No matter how wisely, how carefully you choose your subject, you wind up with one of two problems. You either have the needle in the haystack problem, as I did when I started out on the life of Mrs. Nabokov, the wife of the writer, a woman who was pathologically private, stoic, selfless, formal, all qualities that make for a lousy book. Or, and nothing could be worse, I decided after this. And so I went on to write a book about Benjamin Franklin's exhaustively documented years in France, thereby incurring the haystack and the haystack problem, than which I assure you nothing could be worse. For those eight years that Franklin spends in France, that they're the eight years of the American Revolution and the peace that follows, the documentation here in America is two and a half times as great as it is for the rest of his life combined. And that's not counting the French materials. Um, in Paris, Franklin was surrounded by a net of French spies who were surrounded by a net of British spies. And as far as I can tell, each of these men was paid by the word. Nothing, nothing, I, I promise you, was too trivial. Um, for them to report on, including the state of Franklin's laundry, which was always immaculately white, and his dinner menu. There was a precocious amount of apple pie consumed by his household, by the way. Everyone who owned a pen wrote a memoir in the 18th century, and those who didn't appeared to own a newspaper. But they were both official French newspapers and unofficial French newspapers, and their reports reliably contradicted each other. I might add that John Adams was also in Paris at the time, he appears to have owned several pens. He missed his wife dreadfully. He had very little to do, and he wrote a great deal about Benjamin Franklin. But that's another story. I should also say, actually, in deference to Richard Holmes, I thought of Richard daily um, because I spent a year and a half in Paris doing this research. Most of Franklin's materials did not get through to the American Congress, so the best place to read them is in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Paris. And Richard has a wonderful line in one of his essays about the problem with doing any kind of research in Paris is that if your editor calls you and they find that you're not home, they assume that you're out having a good time. <laughs> um, I just want to go on the record as saying that I wasn't having a good time. I was in the archives every day, um, which was great if you don't mind working under low light and turning over your passport and arriving at the appointed time and reserving your documents in advance and filling out a pass to go to the ladies' room and not complaining when the archivists go out on strike. 
So what then do Benjamin Franklin and Cleopatra have in common? Or put another way, why would a relatively experienced, predominantly sane biographer who reads neither Greek nor Latin and who's happiest in a dusty archive attempt a biography of a first century queen? Let me say at the outset that I didn't think entirely, I wasn't entirely sure it was possible. I'd had Cleopatra in my mind as a subject for a long time, but I just didn't see a way to write a traditional chronicle of her life. She fascinated me for every possible reason. I, I kept thinking of her as that sort of rare combination of Delilah meets Catherine the Great meets Jackie O. You know, it was sort of history and legend all bound together. And from the biographer's point of view, this was really the Mount Everest. Um, the idea struck me less, though, as biography than paleontology. Um, we may live in the post-factual age, as someone recently said, but she lived in the pre-factual one. I was probably most fascinated because I was startled by my own ignorance. Here was a woman whom we think of as Egyptian, but who was in fact Greek, whom we remember as beautiful, but whom every ancient chronicler swore was more intelligent and more charming than she was beautiful. Here was a woman whom we had somehow conflated with Nefertiti, who lived 1,300 years before Cleopatra, and to whom Cleopatra was not even related. And here was a woman who successfully ruled a rich and fractious country for over two decades. She's the only woman in, ant in antiquity who ruled by herself, whom we have reduced to this slinky seductress. She was, however, and not so incidentally, the richest person, man or woman, in the Mediterranean world, she lived in the most cultured city of her day. Alexandria, at the time, is really the center of culture, while Rome is still a backwater. And hers was the most enlightened of atmospheres. She knew things that would be forgotten until the Renaissance, the value of pi, the behavior of linear perspective, the existence of the equator. And gender mattered less than competence in her palace, as it did generally in Egypt at the time, in, in Cleopatra's Egypt, women operated mills, and they owned land, they leased vineyards, they divorced husbands, they inherited equally. In short, they enjoyed rights that they would not again enjoy for something like 2,000 years. And yet, after all of that, Cleopatra melts into a puddle of myths and misconceptions. She's become, to us, a cigarette, a mascara, a video game, a slot machine, a strip club, or a synonym for Elizabeth Taylor. And at this time of year, you'll see her name all over the internet because hers is the most popular of Halloween costumes. Someone asked me um, recently when I realized that this book could actually be written. And I answered a little glibly, but not inaccurately, that I realized it could be written when I finished writing it. But there was another moment. There was one other moment, in truth. It was when I finally noticed um, that we had, an act we had actual 2,000-year-old quotes from Cleopatra, and that we could hear just the tiniest murmur of her voice. Um, for the most part, that's thanks to Plutarch. On the one hand, it pays to remember that Plutarch was writing a good century after Cleopatra's death. He is as far removed from her as we are from Ulysses Grant. On the other, as a modern biographer recently reminded me, there were no tape recorders in the 19th century either. It goes without saying that quoted material is generally approximate. And as I'd learned from Ben Franklin, even the most comprehensive material can refuse to give up answers. Probably I couldn't see my way to writing Cleopatra until those years buried in Franklin's archive. Five years in those miles and miles of paper, and I still can't tell you who the mother of his son was. I doubt anyone ever will. And I knew there were questions that could never be answered, but I also knew that that had nothing to do with the millennia that separate us from Cleopatra. What went on between Virginia Woolf and her brother? How did Shelley die? What was the problem really with Emily Dickinson? Where is Jimmy Hoffa? None, none of these questions have answers either. In some cases, they have answers. They don't have answers because we have an overload of information. Too many accounts can spoil the truth. How then was it possible to write about her? I should probably mention at this juncture that I'm here on false pretenses. It is true that I have written a biography of Cleopatra, but it is not true that you can buy it today because it isn't on sale for another two weeks. But then you can buy it. You could buy several copies, in fact. And, and, the one, and it's beautiful, so you might want to buy one for your living room table and the other to read. And, and the one you want to buy is the one with my name, Stacey Schiff, on it, not the other one. Anyway, its publication date is November 1st. But let me go back to that 
line of dialogue in Plutarch for a minute. It comes in the course of a marvelous account of Cleopatra and Mark Antony out fishing on a carefree Alexandrian afternoon. Plutarch meant to use the incident to illustrate what he calls <clears throat> Antony's boyish pranks, but it offers something else as well. The most accomplished military commander of his day, Antony is unable to lure a single fish from the fertile waters of Egypt. Humiliated, it's always worse when you have your girlfriend at your side and even worse when she's the queen of Egypt, he arranges for one of his servants to attach several pre-caught fish to his line. And these he begins to reel in one after the other with great gusto. The scam is not lost on Cleopatra. She's competitive by nature and she has a very impish sense of humor. And so she arranges for all of their friends to come watch her highly skilled Roman friend the next day when she also arranges for one of her servants to attach an imported salted herring to Mark Antony's hook. And this he pulls from the waters of Egypt to peals of laughter. On the spot, she advises him to forget about fishing and attend to his real responsibilities. He is meant to be hunting not for fish, but for cities, kingdoms, and continents. She's sly and she's saucy, but there's also something a little bit familiar in her tone. It's one known to every woman whose husband owns a set of golf clubs. Of course, it also made me wonder about Plutarch's wife. So yes, there were some terrific constraints. I was used to knowing what my subject had had for dinner and what he or she fretted about before he fell asleep. And in this case, the record was as skewed as it was spotty. All bets were off. The Nile is not where it used to be. Ancient Alexandria is lost. Some of it is in the harbor of Alexandria, and I don't scuba dive. The Egyptian coastline has changed. So have the language, the culture, the religion, and the calendar. Don't even ask me about the prices. And you have to get used to counting backward, too. I mean, Cleopatra was born in 69, and she dies in 30 BC. This drove the copy editor crazy. Essentially, you check all your preconceptions at the door when you enter the world of the Ptolemies, Cleopatra's dynasty. It's difficult to write about maternity in a family where children routinely poison their parents and parents dismember their children. This was admittedly new to me. At the same time, great literature is about ambiguity, and it, it struck me that biography could occasionally afford to be as well. You can't demand order, even answers, of the classical world. And arguably, you rarely can at all when it comes to the human heart. But you can, you can do a lot with it, especially given the last 50 years of fine scholarship on the Hellenistic world. Virginia Woolf once remarked of an imperfect novel that the string didn't quite unite the pearls, but that the pearls were there. It was very much in my mind as I worked, as was Julian Barnes's great alternate definition of a net, a series of holes tied together by string. There were huge unknowns, but there were known knowns among them, several subjects that no one had really approached before. For starters, there was Cleopatra's wealth. There was her relationship with Herod and how the two rulers dealt very differently with the rise of Rome. There was her education about which we can be really specific and which reveals a great deal about how she thought and spoke. And of course, I had one terrific advantage. Human nature is remarkably constant. It has changed not one iota since the first century BC. You can read Cicero on how not to spoil a child. You can read countless texts on how women are shrill and unbending in their demands, but loose in their morals. They should stay home and take care of the children. A friend of one's friend was already one's enemy. Essentially, every problem that Cleopatra had with Rome is the problem that a woman in power faces today with very little variation and arguably better birth control. The successful woman is sexualized, shrill, and unnatural. And when a woman sleeps with two of the most successful and powerful men of her day, she is the seductress, even if both of those men happen to be celebrated for their voracious sexual appetites. It helps to remember, by the way, that the commentators are human too, and we all of us write in the time in which we live. Let me give you just one example. At the end of one of the best 20th century biographies of Cleopatra, we see Cleopatra preparing to meet Octavian, who's defeated her. She's been on a hunger strike. It's, her, it's the two of their first interview, and it's days before she will kill herself. Here is how the biographer introduces this fraught and critical moment. I quote, she was essentially a woman, 
And now, in her condition of physical weakness, she acted precisely as any other overwrought member of her sex might have behaved under similar circumstances. How we constitute and reconstitute history was on my mind all the way through as I worked. This, of course, is a central problem always in writing history. Those closest to events have the best information and the most at stake. The most informed source is also the most involved source. The later chroniclers know less, but they can say more. With each book, I've been well into the work before I realized that there was something utterly rudimentary that I had forgotten to research. In this case, it was that I needed to understand precisely who the men who left us Cleopatra's story were. I had gone to the desert where Cleopatra was exiled. I had soaked up the Alexandrian color. All of it before I realized that I needed to know my sources as well as I knew my subject. Of those who actually knew Cleopatra and who wrote about her, there are three. Julius Caesar, who was married to someone else during their affair and focused on Rome and understandably reluctant to mention Cleopatra. Nicholas of Damascus, the source for her dealings with Herod, who'd been the tutor to her children and who changed sides after her death. And Cicero, who rarely had a kind word for anyone and who could really not stomach a smart, rich, educated woman with a quick wit and a better library than he had. I tried to always keep in mind who was a sensationalist and who was a scold, who had set eyes on Egypt and who despised the place. From those endless French newspapers of the 1770s, I knew the difference too between propaganda and hearsay. In Cleopatra's case, we owe a huge debt to both. Biased and inaccurate, though they may have been, the Romans who left us her story did us a tremendous favor. Normally, women are difficult to write about. They keep lousy records, and their lives tend to slip through the cracks. Cleopatra owes her immortality to her enemies. Had they hated her less, they would not have preserved her for us. She's one of the few women in history whose detractors have enlarged rather than erased her role. She's also one of the few losers whom we remember. Had she been a man, she would have been forgotten today, like most of the other Eastern sovereigns whom Rome eliminated. And for the record, had Rome not intervened, had Cleopatra been dealt a stronger hand, she would have faced a different but equally vicious enemy. In the normal course of events, she would have been deposed, poisoned, or hacked to pieces or exiled by one of her own four children, in which case we would never have heard of her at all. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, could you say something about how well uh, Cleopatra understood the strategies that uh, the different Roman factions were practicing against her and therefore kind of assess her uh, political acuity and deftness? Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, essentially what Cleopatra is left with is a, a Rome completely pulled apart by civil wars. And especially after Caesar's death, the great conundrum for her is whom whom to side with. I mean, she has banked entirely on Caesar. She's in Rome at the time of his murder, which may in fact be a contributing factor to his murder. And all chaos, as, you, as many of you know, suddenly breaks loose. So, so which of the possible successors should she side with? And it's very clear that for the first um, year or so, she tries to sit things out. Everyone comes calling. It's almost like a fairy tale moment where you know, each person in turn comes to see if she will back them. And she, and, she, and she definitely temporizes. There's a real hesitation there to figure out whom she should ally herself with. And of course, in the end, she, she chooses Mark Antony, Caesar's protege. Um, it's interesting when you think about it, because had she allied herself with Octavian, who, at the, who becomes Augustus, who, who would have seen the unlikeliest of choices, all would have worked out very differently. But at the time, he, he seemed like he was entirely the dark horse, and Antony made a great deal of sense. And what's fascinating there is just the way she adapts herself to each of the factions in turn, and does try to do her best to supply everyone with what he asks, so as to hedge her bets. There's a real sense of political strategy with her. Yes? I wondered what languages besides Latin you had to work off of for your original sources, and did you have any issues with the translations that were made of these original sources? Um, the only two languages that a, a smart person would have learned for this book were Latin and Greek, neither of which I have. 
what I did do, um, and which helped tremendously, was to compare translations. Um, because of, needless to say, over the years, there have been rather a few translations of Suetonius or Plutarch or Dio. And, and somehow, in, in comparing those translations, a lot of nuance falls out. Um, so there was a great deal in, for me of going back and back over various passages with someone who is, in fact, an expert in Greek and trying to see what meanings I could leach from sort of between the lines. Um, it's, it's a nightmare for me not to be able to speak um, a language in which these sources exist. On the other hand, these sources are so much later. These, are, these, are, these men are writing 100 and 150 and 200 years after Cleopatra. Um, I, I didn't feel as if the literal word, there were no letters from Cleopatra. There was, alas, no diary. So I didn't feel as if my being unable to read her was going to be an issue, as it would have been with the Nabokovs. The Nabokovs did me a huge favor because in their letters, when they wrote something intimate to each other, they broke from Russian and they wrote it in French, which I do speak and read, so that they could be talking about you know, who was going to take out the laundry in Russian, and then it would suddenly break into this wonderfully intimate romantic paragraph of French, blessedly. Yes? Um, what do you, can you hear me? What do you think of Cleopatra's political background? I'm sorry, Cleopatra's? Um, political background. Her political background? Yeah. That's a good question. She, she was clearly schooled to rule, and in those days what was great, or what was interesting anyway, is that pretty much any one of the, um, any one of the children was educated in the same way. Um, and it's fairly clear to us today, and this was something that fascinated me, which it seemed to me no one had touched before, um, it's pretty clear what she would have read and what she would have studied. And in fact, her education, her, her sense of rhetoric, her training in rhetoric would have been nearly identical to that of Caesar. And the texts that were known to her and memorized by her, much, much of it Homer, um, Aeschylus, Euripides, were the same texts that anyone living anywhere in the Greek world, anyone of an elite education living anywhere in the Greek world would also have known, so that you very much spoke a common language. And it was from those texts that you really drew your political lessons. Um, did she know her Egyptian history? I can't imagine she didn't. Have we any proof of that? No. Yes. Um, would, you, uh, would you say that there's any woman today that symbolizes uh, Cleopatra's situation? Um, I have a hard time thinking of anyone who would dismember her children. Um, although actually, no, I don't. I can think of someone. Um, no, I think that, I think the gutsiness um, of Cleopatra, I mean, I think there's a huge amount of strategy. Um, this is a woman who is a champion strategist and who could be ruthless and who could truly plot out a military campaign. Um, is there an exact, um, Parallel to that of someone today, no. But I think there are numerous women we could all name who've, who've shown those qualities. What's unusual about Cleopatra is that she, is, she comes from a line of female rulers. She has plenty of female role models. So there, have been, there are other women in Egyptian history who had done what she did. Whereas for us, this is now something of a novelty. So she's coming at it interestingly in a, in a less traditional way than we are. Um, I'm just wondering why you have chosen biography as your particular form of historical writing. Do you think biography helps us get at certain political or historical social questions in a different way, or do you think it's, it lends for more compelling research and writing? You know, someone once <clears throat> described biography, I think, very accurately as gossip with footnotes. Um, I'm really good on the footnotes, although I never knew I wrote vertical footnotes until Richard spoke just now. Um, Human nature interests me greatly, and I think as a reader, I always prefer to come to my history through the character of someone else and through the live intelligence and personality of someone else. It just makes it more accessible somehow. It makes it more exciting. Um, but that's my reader's answer. My writer's answer is that I quick early on discovered that I loved having this parallel existence, that I loved living two lives. I've, I've, I've long wanted to write an essay about how the biographer has two lives, the life she writes about and the, which she understands and the life she lives of which she is completely clueless. Um, and there's the sense there always of just being able to see the world through two different optics, which I find hugely appealing. Um, and the other an obvious reason, I suppose, is that when I began writing, 
um, and I had no idea how to write a book, although I had been an editor. Biography appealed because it has a very natural beginning, middle, and end. And it's a very easy kind of, it seemed to me a relatively easy thing to structure. There's also a very gratifying element to biography, of course, which is that no matter what happens, in the end you get to kill your subject. Two quick questions. Um, what are you reading now, and what are some ideas for future biographies? Just a little louder. What are you reading now, and what are some future ideas for biographies, individuals? Um, what I'm reading now is almost inevitably fiction, and I don't know if that's because I feel nonfiction is homework, um, but I gener or because I just I, I so am such a sucker for literary style that I would almost always prefer to pick up a novel than I would to pick up a biography, which I can't always be guaranteed to find perfect satisfaction in. Um, and so what I'm reading now, and of course we're all reading now, is the, the Franzen. Um, and what I'm reading after that is just because it's on the night table is The Happy Marriage. Um, but it's all fiction. There is nothing, oh, that's not true. Ron Chernow's George Washington biography is on the table. But you know what? It's, it's going to sink to the bottom, I can tell you now. Um, as for my next subject, um, like Richard, I don't have to answer that question, but if any of you has an idea, please talk to me later. Okay. Can you say a little bit more about the tradition of female rulers that Cleopatra came from? Um, Cleopatra, as I said, is the only um, ruler, the only woman in antiquity to have ruled alone. For reasons that are not entirely clear, at least to me, um, there is, a, there is a huge sense of equality among the Ptolemies, her dynasty. The women and the men are, are, are equally gifted um, at making decisions. Most of the other women who, who do rule either rule temporarily or rule in tandem with a little brother or a husband or a brother to whom she is married, for that matter, um, which, which is not Cleopatra's case. But there doesn't seem to be a very serious distinction between the genders in terms of, um, in terms of ruling. This seems to, either one was, seems to have gone over perfectly well. Um, I'm sorry, I just forgot what I was about to say. Oh, and, and where this comes from, I mean, whether this is because the goddess Isis is such a powerful influence, whether it's because it has, there's just a sense that women and men have been ruling beautifully together for so long, whether it's because some of those earlier Ptolemaic queens were incredibly effective, cruel but effective, is unclear. But, it, but what, is, what becomes abundantly clear is that there was really no problem accepting a female pharaoh when Cleopatra came to the throne. It also, it makes, she makes it much easier by getting rid of her brothers and her other sister, which is always a helpful thing to do when you're a monarch. Um, you mentioned that there are no letters or diaries from Cleopatra, so how do we know so much about her personality? I'm still looking for the diary. Um, how we know about the personality are th those little glimpses, um, like the line I talked about from Plutarch, and again, here you're squaring sources, but it, what's interesting is how much the sources um, tend to repeat or echo each other. So that the impishness that I referred to, for example, her, her response to Antony on the fishing expedition um, is very much mirrored in other accounts in which she is irreverent and sly um, and by no means a docile and um, unassuming presence. So I was taking my cues from the material we have, um, which as I say is 100 or 200 or 300 years after her birth, but time moved differently in those days. I don't need to tell you this. It was slower in those days. And there is a sense that these stories that were handed down were being handed down with some consistency. Um, in response to your quest for a new topic, I think John Hay oh, would be thank you. a good one. <laughs> um, I don't think that there's been a one volume good um, biography on him, but I also do have a question. Um, as somebody who myself would one day like to enter um, the historical writing field, um, sometimes I feel overwhelmed by the fact that so much has already been written. Um, and obviously when you write something new, you don't want to repeat what others have already said. You want your own perspective, something new, something different, um, something that's not going to bore people. Um, how do you go finding your own personal perspective on subjects? That's also a great question. I, I long ago interviewed um, Joe Ellis for something I was writing about, the anxiety of influence with the previous biographers. And I asked him um, whether you read the secondary sources. I mean, I, was, I think I was working on Ben Franklin at the time. You know, do you read the 376 other Franklin biographies? 
And he was very clear about saying, that is essentially a Bermuda Triangle. Do not go there. You will never emerge. You will spend the next five years reading the secondary sources. Um, so what I, what I have done, insofar as I have been sane about that, um, is to have decided that it's my Franklin or it's my Cleopatra. And what's different are not necessarily the answers or the materials. It's the questions we ask. So I'm bringing to the subject questions or problems that the previous biographer didn't bring or the previous hundred biographers didn't bring and that, that, that those secondary materials are just gonna have to lie there. It's easier when you don't have to read them. For this book, I felt I, there were se some secondary sources I had to read because there was so little primary material. For Ben Franklin, it was really easy to, to ignore all secondary materials except when it concerned minor characters. I mean, I think I read a lot of biographies of the Lee brothers, the people who came in peripherally to my story. Yes. How do you know somebody hasn't asked it if you haven't read them? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't. I could be wrong. I'll just cross my fingers. <laughs> We're done. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.